OME or otitis media with effusion is a buildup of fluid in the middle ear behind the eardrum and that's a space that normally contains air that you're aware of when you yawn and swallow. OME is what I would call an occupational hazard of early childhood. So if you occupy early childhood, at some point you're going to get it. The research studies show that just about 100% of kids get at least one episode by school age. Uh, if we go to any preschool environment on any given day, about 15 or 20% of the kids have fluid in their ears. It probably goes away quickly. So it's, it's ubiquitous. It's going to be more common in kids who have other issues such as Down syndrome, cleft palate, uh, kids who get sick frequently and have large adenoids get, get more fluid, but it, it affects kids very, very commonly. Well, sometimes they may not have any symptoms at all, and it may just be detected on a routine checkup or visit, but more commonly, they could have some hearing troubles, particularly in a noisy or crowded room, or if they're away from the speaker or not looking at the speaker. They may complain of discomfort, so young kids may bang their ears or rub their ears or not feed well. They may just stop breastfeeding, and sometimes they may just wake up a lot at night for no reasons. Other symptoms can be clumsiness or frequent falling, and some of the older kids can have school issues because they don't perform well in school if they're missing things because of the fluid. So there are two aspects of what's new in the guideline. First would be the methodology, which has changed a lot since the one in 2004, developed by the American Academy of Pediatrics, and second would be the content. So from a methodology standpoint, we engage consumers. We have lots of teaching aids, frequently asked questions, uh, grids to aid in shared decisions. We have action statement profiles that are very robust and describe all the components that went into the recommendations and emphasize the quality improvement opportunities. So every statement in the guideline is linked to a quality improvement opportunity. There's a new algorithm flowchart that links all the statements together in a very cohesive and understandable way. There are new statements from a content perspective that deal with managing the kids who fail newborn hearing screens because of ear fluid, and that's the reason two-thirds of them would fail. There are new statements about outcomes and documenting that the kids do get better. Uh, new statements on things like medical therapy where intranasal steroids that previously were used are no longer recommended. Probably the main key takeaway is not to worry. This is a ubiquitous common problem that kids get, the vast majority of which goes away on its own. And uh, in the words of Ben Franklin, the best physician is the one who knows the worthlessness of the most medications. So generally the less you do to try and actively manage most of this ear fluid is the best. Uh, the other take home message for parents is that not all kids are affected equally. So if you're a parent and your child has uh, special needs, so maybe they have a need for speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, they're getting special instruction, they have Down syndrome, they're in the autism spectrum, they have a hearing loss other than middle ear fluid, they have severe visual problems. These are kids that don't tolerate the ear fluid well and they often benefit from more aggressive identification and management and often the ear tubes. Uh, the other key message for, for parents is the importance of follow-up. That rarely the ear fluid can cause problems, it can affect your eardrum, it can weaken it, cause it to collapse or develop problems. So it's important to follow up with the doctor until the fluid goes away.